Good morning. My name is John Coates here in Natick, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. This is April 9th, 2001. And this morning we are pleased to have with us Harold Morris. Harold, how are you today? Very good, thank you. And I understand right from the outset that they called you Buddy. From here on in, it's going to be Buddy. Mm -hmm. May I ask how old you are? Uh, 76. You were born in uh, 1924, is uh, that? Yes, 528, 24. Okay, and what is your current address? Natick. You live in Natick, and your current marital status? Married. Uh, children? Uh, one. And grandchildren? Uh, three. Three. Should we try for great-grandchildren? <laughs> uh, not yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> They're still in education. Okay. Where were you born, buddy? Uh, I was born up on uh, 236 South Main Street in Natick. So you are a townie, a real townie. Yeah. Good for you. And were you raised uh, your whole life now in Natick? Uh, no. At, uh, uh, I moved around quite a bit during the Depression. And uh, uh, in 1939, uh, I was located in Framingham where I continued on through high school uh, at Framingham High School and uh, that's where I entered the service from when I graduated from high school in about six weeks I was in, in the military. And what did your folks do? Can you tell us what your dad did for work? Uh, he, was a, he was a stonemason. A stonemason? Yeah. Good for him. And, uh, uh, what kind of work did he do? Well, uh, he, uh, he liked to do drywalls, uh, stonework, you know, like field stone, mm -hmm. and uh, as uh, my grandfather did, Michael Morris. Uh, and uh, in fact, I think Michael Morris, my grandfather, did uh, some of the work that's present up there in St. Patrick's Cemetery, so they tell me. Yes, at the right. And so forth, yeah, yeah. And uh, he lived up on South Main Street also. Yeah. Uh, at one time, I lived with them for about six weeks. <laughs> I was, uh, rather, uh, a year and a half. A year and a half, I lived with them. And uh, uh, went to Oak Grove School for that time. And, and, and what about your mother? Is she uh, a housewife? My mother, well, uh, of course, at that time, mothers were home, right? Yeah. And eventually, uh, she uh, worked in an apron factory up in, uh, up in Framingham uh, when I lived with her up there. And uh, she continued to work there until her retirement. She's been gone quite a few years now. What about uh, brothers and sisters? Uh, brothers and sisters, I had seven. Uh, I was the first one to, out of the family to graduate from high school. Uh, the four preceding me, they, at that time during the Depression, you're allowed to quit school at 14 and go to work to support the family. It was the time of the CCCs and so forth. Yeah. Uh, height of the Depression. So uh, uh, I was fifth in line age-wise, and I, fortunately I was able to finish high school. You, you spoke of the CCC, that's the Civilian Conservation Corps? Uh, I'm sorry? That's the Civilian Conservation Corps? Well, at that time, there were uh, some of the older ones uh, yeah. in did my your, neighborhood. Did your the older C brothers go into that? Uh, no, uh, they weren't old enough, but uh, some of the neighborhood, uh, they had the uh, olive green outfits on uh, of the CCCs uh, whenever they'd get home. So it was tough times, and uh, the uh, so as they say, I I was fortunate enough to to get through high school, be uh, the first one. Yeah, <laughs> and I yes. appreciated that. Good for you. Do you want to talk just a minute about what it was like back in 1939, 1940, when the uh, the United States was in pretty tough shape, but you read about or heard about a war in Europe. Can you remember oh, yes. those days and how it affected your life? Uh, well, uh, you were aware of it. Uh, one, one thing that amazes me, 
Uh, I was in high school when the war started, uh, when Pearl Harbor happened. Uh, my older brother and a cousin, we went down to Camp Edwards on a Sunday to visit Carlo and Tinarelli, who was killed over in Belgium when the paratroopers later. But they, uh, he had just gotten back from maneuvers down in uh, Georgia, I believe. Is this your was. brother? Carlo and Tinarelli. They were a large family up in the There okay. were about eight of them in the service. Yeah. And their father was in the Merchant Marine. And uh, we left there on Sunday afternoon, I would guess about three o'clock in the afternoon. Pearl Harbor had already been bombed, and there wasn't a sign of it on the base at Camp Edwards. I could never figure that out. We found out when we got home in Framingham. And uh, why it, and how it was kept so quiet, even talking with Carlo there, who was in the service, that we had gone to visit, he didn't know anything about it at three o'clock Sunday afternoon. I don't know how they kept it so quiet or why. This is at Camp Edwards, down the Cape. And you were still in high school at that time? Yeah, I was still in high school at that time. And uh, uh, of course we knew, and I say to some of the younger people today, uh, our outlet wasn't uh, what college am I going to, <laughs> it was what branch of the service am I going yes. to go into when I uh, get out of high school. And uh, some did. Uh, I might have had two or three in my class in Framingham who, who left high school and joined a branch of the service. Uh, I know them, some in Natick that did. They were friends of mine. And uh, uh, I'm amazed somewhat when I see recently that finally, after all this time, they're issuing a diploma to some of these people. They left early to serve their country. And uh, uh, I don't know why it took so long. It just didn't seem right to me when I see it, even recently uh, in the newspaper. Uh, so yes, uh, we certainly were aware. And then uh, uh, in the high school, uh, they were starting to have a bit of programs on the Air Corps and so forth. And uh, uh, there were uh, civil defense programs mm -hmm. and so forth. Can you can you tell us uh, or bring us up to date on w what the status, your status was so far as a draft was concerned? What was going on in 1939-40 uh, for guys your age? Did you have to sign up for a draft? Uh, yes, I, I don't remember. Just when I I still have the cards, but I don't remember just when it was. Uh, I think uh, something that uh, it was before I graduated. I had a mm -hmm. card, and uh, probably that's why uh, I don't know when it was a reason why I wasn't in there during high school or right after. Actually, it was only six weeks after I got out that I was in. So uh, you, you, was, it, was it a matter of age that when you reached 18, you were subject to the draft? Do you remember that? I don't really, <clears throat> I don't really remember. I think probably it was. Uh, I don't really remember that. And did you think about what branch of service you would prefer to go into? No, actually what happened when we took the bus into, uh, I think I found out in later years that it was the Fargo building. And uh, the different branches of the service actually had recruiters in there. Uh, one of my close friends at the time uh, went in with me. Some of my friends had already gone into the service. Uh, now why why were you on this? <clears throat> why were you on this bus, and where were you going? Just to look over to see what was available to you? Uh, no, this is uh, this this was a final uh, decision, as far as I remember, because I came came out of that place that day, 
knowing I was in the Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't thought of Coast Guard when I was going in there, but they had recruiters for the different branches, and apparently, perhaps even as today, I, I know that my recruiter was looking for, for two men that day. And I turned out to be one of them. And, 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 and talking uh, to him, uh, he uh, gave a promise that actually they kept. I knew then that after boot camp that hopefully I was going to radio operated school. And uh, I guess that was probably part of, part of the package uh, of recruiting to okay. make a promise, I don't know. All right, and what date was that that you entered the service? Uh, let's see. I think that was sometime in uh, in uh, June, because August fifteenth. Of no, what? August eighth is actually yeah. when I got on the train heading for New York. Of what year? Uh, Forty-three. Nineteen forty-three. You are now in the Coast Guard. Yeah. And uh, did any of your the, the buddies from high school? Did they join up in other branches of the service that day? Well, uh, this f friend of mine that went in with me at the moment, I knew others there, but this is a, a street type friend uh, next door. Uh, he didn't know it, but he came out there being in the CBs. In the CBs? The recruiters got him. He ended up over in, uh, uh, over in uh, the Mideast there somewhere, Guam. Over, over in Guam, and uh, in the CBs. So, uh, as I say, they had recruiters there, and uh, when you were going in on the bus, you didn't know what you were going to be in when you got out, <laughs> unless you insisted, I want to be on this particular branch. Say. Now, tell me, tell me about walking into the Fargo building. You walk down a hall, and there's the Air Force there, there's the Navy there, there's the when, and you wind up in the Coast Guard. Yeah. Did you walk into a door and say, what have you got? How did it happen? I don't know. Uh, you don't place that much importance on these, on these things at the moment. When, mm -hmm. when, I, when I look back uh, on any, anything involving uh, what we're talking about now, the service life, uh, it was just another day or another moment. You didn't... Uh, uh, you didn't write it down in a diary. Uh, you tried to uh, pick it up from your memory, and, and it's a, a long number of years ago. And he promised uh, you you could get to uh, radio school, and that this is something you wanted to do. Uh, yes, I. Uh, uh, if I hadn't uh, gone in the service, I certainly wouldn't have had any opportunity for further education beyond high school because. Uh, uh, at one time, I thought I might get an athletic scholarship to Springfield College, but uh, uh, once you go in the military, that's out, right? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, Did he tell you anything else about what you would do in the Coast Guard? Had you ever been to sea on a ship? No, no. And what uh, did you think? You know, you, they got awful little boats in the Coast Guard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, some of them were pretty good size. Uh, I happened to get on a small one. But uh, they have some uh, three and four hundred footers. Uh, we had an icebreaker that was over four hundred feet uh, in the uh, North Atlantic, and uh, so uh, some of them get pretty large. Uh, you went home that day, and uh, yeah, I went you home told that your day, father and I knew, mother. Uh, I went home that day, but I knew I had a date of when I was yeah. going in. What did you tell your parents? Uh, I don't really remember. I, don't, I already had uh, a brother in, uh, my older brother, and uh, I don't remember anything that was said, really. The mothers, the mothers just took it for granted. That's where their children were going, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, when you stop and think of it, <clears throat> did I bring my children up to go over there? in uh, any part of the world. When you were called uh, into active duty, you got that 
card in the mail or something and tells you to report to duty. Uh, where did you go? Into Boston? Uh, no, I got on the train in Framingham. And uh, I'm not sure, but I think they... Uh, I went to uh, Long Island, Manhattan Beach, Long Island. That's where the training station was. And uh, they also had, uh, adjacent to us, they had an area where the Merchant Marine was trained. And uh, so I took the train the first time to New York and uh, via Springfield, uh, Worcester, Springfield, down into Grand Central Station. and. Uh, I must have been like one of those tourists looking around at the high buildings. And someone asked me what I was looking for, and I told them I wanted to get the subway out to, out to Long Island. It turned out it was a bosun mate in the Coast Guard. He was built like a wrestler. And uh, so he instructed me what, uh, what uh, subways to get. I had never been there, never been on a subway. So, I kept looking out every time it stopped, and one time <laughs> the doors came around my, around my neck. <laughs> I had to separate them with my hand. And uh, so anyway, I got out to the base all right. Uh, it was uh, east somewhat from uh, the old Coney Island. Uh, I could, later, uh, later weeks, I could see that in the distance. And uh, so that's where I had my three months of training in uh, Manhattan Beach, Long Island. Was anybody with you from your hometown, or were you absolutely all alone? Uh, no, I hadn't, uh, there might have been somebody from Boston or Melrose or something, but nobody that I knew. Yeah, nobody from Natick Framingham. No, no. You were pretty much alone. Right. You're in boot camp in the Coast Guard. What, what was training like there? What did you do? Well, it's a quick change from civvies, <laughs> as everybody knows. Uh, uh, I can't say that I disliked it. Uh, I accepted it. And uh, uh, everybody I met and all those in that group, we were in like uh, army barrack type buildings that have been quickly constructed. and. Uh, uh, there were probably 40 of us in a large room in bunks. All got along for three months, good. And uh, uh, he made uh, a lot of friendships there. And uh, the, uh, I met Jack Dempsey there, Lou Ambers. And uh, in fact, Jack asked me if I could get by his big hands <laughs> down in the gym. <laughs> I always remember that. So I actually What was Jack Dempsey, Jack Dempsey doing? Hands. What, was Dempsey teaching fighting or uh, for the physical uh, education? Well, so, some of them, uh, I think they were in there as a uh, promotion tool somewhat, as a lot of the athletes were. Uh, they, uh, in Lou Ambers, and uh, there was Ken Armstrong from the old New York Giants football team. Uh, they were, well, he was a bosun mate. And uh, in the athletic program, uh, at part of your training, if you wanted to wrestle, you wanted to box, I did both. And uh, uh, as, a, as a recreation. And uh, so that was, uh, that was really their role. Uh, up at six in the morning and sometimes out of the sack at uh, two o'clock in the morning for some unknown reason and out in the parade grounds and doing the duck walk and this and that. But it was you know, discipline, I guess, when you look back on it. But you accepted that. What about uh, making ready for sea? Uh, did you get in boats? Did you learn to uh, row and yes, swim? Yes, we, uh, we had training on the uh, uh, on, the, on the boats and uh, uh, the uh, uh, rifle range there, not, not too much on the rifle range. And uh, the uh, guard duty along the shore, I had guard duty at night along the shoreline and see the big, big wharf rats in the moonlight. 
but uh, they had to be careful because the Germans were all along the coast at that time, especially mm -hmm. watching the convoys out of Philadelphia. Uh, on some days you could watch for hours and you could see the distant convoy. You'd think the ships were never going to end. So, uh, as I remember, they were concerned that uh, uh, there might be some come ashore, they actually come ashore in they isolated actually did. places. Yeah. So, uh, we had to take our turns doing, doing duty uh, uh, during, the, during the night uh, along the shore. And uh, uh, even though you were out at night, you still had to had to hit the deck at six in the morning and <laughs> sleep later when you could catch it. <laughs> yeah, tell us about looking out at sea and seeing some of those big convoys. That was a very historic thing for you to witness. Uh, were they no lights on, or did what no, did it look no, like? No, and at that time, if I remember correctly, already. Uh, even stores in Natick, I'm assuming, but I know in Framingham, they had the brownouts with some kind of plastic material over the store windows and mm -hmm. so forth and so on. Uh, lights out. Uh, they didn't want it. They didn't want the horizon lit up from cities uh, to indicate where there was a big city because there's the bright sky. Uh, and. Uh, the uh, convoys I would see, I seem to remember that they were actually coming out of Philadelphia, which was south of us. There'd be large ships, small ships, all in the fur aid out on the horizon, quite a distance out. Uh, my brother was on one of those convoys on a troop ship going over to Europe, uh, talking about the convoys. and. Uh, I guess there were literally hundreds of ships sometimes, all types, and they would go so, so long a period of time this direction, and all of a sudden all the ships would go this way, and uh, uh, zigzag course, so it would take longer to get overseas, and uh, they were on the lookout for the wolf packs, the, uh, the German submarines, they were, who were really knocking, knocking ships off during that time. So uh, uh, that is re really is the uh, only only times I've actually saw the the uh, troops, okay. uh, the uh, convoys. Uh, when, when you were at uh, in boot camp here, did you get any specialized training or take tests to show you what you were going to do as your your career in the Coast Guard? Uh, You'd I can't been promised to, to be an, a radio operator. Uh, How did that come about? I, I can't recall other than the promise yeah. on recruiting. Yeah. Uh, but uh, when it was time to break boot camp, uh, most men knew where they were going. Uh, it seems odd today, but uh, one of the men. Uh, was uh, assigned to the Horse Patrol. Uh, the Coast Guard had uh, people on horse at night uh, traveling the beaches watching for any one coming ashore. So one, uh, one man, on, uh, because he was familiar with horses in uh, civilian life, I don't remember where he lived, uh, uh, what state he came from. So he, uh, he was assigned to the horse patrol. Uh, and uh, they kept the promise with me and I went to Atlantic City uh, for my radio training. And uh, I ran up to Joe Frangio, some native out there, talk about uh, running into people. In the small world. Uh, yeah. I, I went to school with him in Natick, and uh, he, he was with the Navy at some school out there. The military had taken over about every hotel in Atlantic City. I was in the Hotel Virginia, and uh, uh, what was the uh, dining room, we called the mess hall then. We slept four in a room, a hotel room. We had two bunks in each hotel room, so the four of us, this at radio school. 
and uh, we had the uh, the whole of the hotel was in there to ourselves, just off the boardwalk. And the Air Corps was out there. They had their hotels and uh, Navy. Uh, I don't know about Army. I, I wouldn't doubt officers training. A lot of the a lot of the, uh, the hotels were uh, areas where they had officer training for the different branches. And uh, so I was there for six months. Six and, months. Yeah, six months. At Atlantic City, as I, as I recall, that was one of the places that they they put the big curtains up along the boardwalk to keep the light from shining out and silhouetting the ship uh, ships at sea. Did you see any of that? I don't. I don't remember what you call it, the curtains. Uh, in fact, uh, Convention Hall was on the boardwalk. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, I don't remember now because you don't make notes. Uh, we were allowed to go down there and see a couple of the big bands uh, of some sort perform. And I always thought one of them was like a Lucky Strike program, the big convention hall. So uh, off duty, we were allowed to go down there and uh, uh, see these uh, radio broadcast performances. Uh, to this day, I don't know who I saw. You were there, you were in boot camp three months, so if you joined the service in August, September, October, you got a, down to Atlantic City about that late fall or late fall, yeah. early winter? Well, let's say August, and then September, October, November, yeah, yeah. In yeah and if you were in I this... I would say in November and radio school for six months. Yeah. So that takes you up to May of 45, like in 44, when you got out of radio school, Yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And what, did, tell, tell us about radio school. What does that mean, six months of that? Well, uh, it, uh, we had, uh, we had uh, lengthy classes every day uh, during the week, uh, other than Saturday and Sunday. So five days a week, basically, uh, we were in class and uh, starting out with uh, uh, headsets, uh, typewriters. I had never typed, so I had to not only learn the code, but I also had to learn to type. And uh, uh, in learning the code, you start, they start you out, it seems. Uh, almost absurd now uh, with uh, one word a minute, which would be five letters. And, uh, uh, but when you don't know how to type and you have to transfer what you're hearing down to your fingers and find the keys for the first time, <laughs> it's, it's a little difficult. It was easier for those who had worked in offices and so forth than they were those who already knew how to type. What what code were you using? Is Morse this Morse code? code? Morse code, yeah. And uh, we'd listen to that for hours, and uh, gradually, uh, over the weeks, it would build up. They would increase the speed, increase the speed, and uh, uh, they were. I'm trying to remember just what else. There was procedures. Uh, it isn't just copy and code, there's uh, abbreviations, uh, uh, formation on papers and so forth, like I have a couple of them here uh, that you uh, fill out properly when you're actually taking some uh, uh, serious code business. And uh, so uh, it was quite intense. Uh, I don't remember. Uh, Every day, we didn't do any. We didn't do any marching, anything like that. It was school, 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 and uh, uh, eventually, I don't know how long we were there. That they would give you the weekend off and uh, be back in there Monday morning. Where did you go? Did you get home? Did, well, they had. Did you go up to Boston. The city. Uh, Atlantic City was the honeymoon before the war. That was the honeymoon capital of the United States, but it wasn't during the war. So there were 13, at least 13 movies there, 
still, I think probably they were all operating. Very few people uh, at night and uh, dimly lit, as we were talking, uh, being right there on the waterfront, they weren't going to have the place lit up. And uh, I think probably via Philadelphia, some of us might have gone to Times Square. I'm not sure, but I think I know I was in Times Square a couple of times and uh, uh, saw the uh, Sasso Theater performances there or something. And uh, I might have come home. Yeah, I'm sure I came home uh, on some weekends, but I would get home when I look back on it, it was kind of a, almost a waste of time because I'd get home uh, about 8 o'clock Saturday night and I'd have to leave at 11 something Sunday morning to go back. <laughs> yeah. But rather than hang around out there in the strange city, uh, once in a while I'd come home. In um, May of 44, you're, you're about to get out of school or, or out, out of this radio school. There was a, a heck of a lot going on in Europe and in the South Pacific. How did you get your news of what was happening in the war? And did you think about, uh, you, you guys must have been anxious to get a placement. You know, give me a ship. The, uh, well, uh, when it was graduation time, uh, It depended on where they needed people. I understood some of them went to uh, like a landing craft in the Pacific, uh, and that type of thing. I can't prove it, but I understand some of them were. Uh, uh, Boston was the first naval district, and uh, they had one in uh, Sitka. I, I don't remember now whether that was number eight or ten. Sitka? Sitka. In Alaska? Alaska. Yeah. Because of the Japanese, with the Aleutian Islands. So uh, it seems almost unbelievable to me it, when I look back. Uh, they needed two men in the first naval district, which is Boston, and they needed two in Sitka. And unbelievable, they let us draw straws, and I, and I drew Boston. The so, luck of the draw. Yeah, I could have been out it, in Alaska. Thing. But it, would, would that have been your first choice of any, any service in the world? Did you want to go to Boston, or did you have something else in mind? Well, I knew, that, I knew that when I went aboard ship, I would, uh, uh, I would be, uh, my home port would be Boston, which it still is, down on uh, down at Constitution Wharf there. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, when the tall ships were in, uh, I took the harbor cruise, and my wife and myself and a sister-in-law, and uh, two of the ships that I, uh, I went, I wasn't on them, and I couldn't believe that they were still there at the dock, uh, still in service. Uh, the Escanaba and the Spencer. The Spencer went quite, the Spencer had quite a history out there in the Atlantic somewhere. It was a fast cruiser like. Okay, you know, so the a cruiser trade ship. The fact that you went to Boston uh, didn't mean you were going to be stationed at Boston, but from Boston, you would go out on a ship to God knows where. Is that right? Uh, that's right. Uh, you didn't know where you were going to be. I could, I could have been assigned to some, some place down the Cape, I suppose. But I was assigned to assigned to the Arundel when I arrived in Boston. Uh, With one other guy. I didn't know that I was going on the Arundel, but it was already predetermined that that's where I was going. So. With this other fellow that yeah. was in your outfit. I'm sorry? You say two of you went to Boston. Yeah. This yeah. was another guy from your outfit. Went. I don't know where the other fellow went. He but you went to the Arundel. Yeah, I went to the Arundel. Okay, so now in May of 44, you're assigned to a ship permanently in the Coast Guard. In Boston. And where did you go? Well, if I 
recall correctly, uh, I wasn't long on there, and we were we were heading to Greenland uh, almost immediately, it seemed, and uh, because I didn't uh, I didn't have any time in Boston. Uh, I was on the ship, and we were gone, and uh, we headed up to Greenland. Uh, latter part of May, I'd say. You want to take a second to tell us about the Arundel, how big a ship, how many people aboard it? Well, it was about, uh, I can only estimate it, uh, the, the, size, the length of it now, uh, I, I guess that is about 110 foot. And uh, we had, uh, well, we had three, three radio operators, we had one, we had three officers. We weren't big enough to have a pharmacist mate. I don't know if you got sick who you'd go to uh, when I look back. Uh, we had our machinists, we had gunners mate. Uh, we had depth charges aboard on the, on the fan tail and uh, one or two guns. How big? Don't ask me what size. No. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> would, would they be the seven, five inches? I, 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 I'm not familiar with guns, but something tells me to use the figure 75, 75 millimeter. I could be far wrong, but uh, they're pretty good size. Uh, we only had, uh, yeah, we had two gunners made. At one time, we only had one. But the bosun mates knew how to operate. Uh, they didn't leave you unguarded. Uh, and uh, I would say that we had about 28 crew, about 28, including officers. It varied. It varied. Uh, uh, for some reason, uh, you might see that one of the machinist mates was sent back to the state for some reason. Or, uh, one of the bosun mates, and then somebody would come and replace him. Uh, but uh, it was uh, had reinforced bow, uh, very cramped radio shack, about well, four steps down from where the captain was up in the uh, wheelhouse, and. Uh, we had uh, direction finding in the radio shack. Uh, usually the executive officer, he didn't have to use that too much, but the executive officer would operate that, pick up these land-based areas as they would direction. And uh, uh, Loran, that was uh, one of my responsibilities when we were out, uh, uh, when we, uh, uh, way to anchor was to uh, not only listen to the uh, radios, but uh, watch the uh, radar, as you might see in at Logan Airport, that will show uh, anything in the distance, and you could bring it in closer and closer if you wanted to. Uh, say instead of five miles, you could bring the circles into three miles, or you could bring them out to 25 miles. But you, you, you're in the Coast Guard nine months now, um, from the time you enlisted. Was this the first time you'd ever sailed on a ship? Oh, yeah, yeah. Ever? Other than, <laughs> other than going to, uh, from Boston down to uh, Provincetown <laughs> on the pleasure boat. <laughs> right. What were, do you have any idea what your, what was your mission? Why were you being sent to Greenland? Uh, when the Germans took over Denmark, uh, Denmark owns Greenland, uh, although it's somewhat freed now, they have representation now. Uh, and uh, so the United States was, uh, Denmark uh, had the United States as kind of a protectorate of Greenland. and. Uh, First thing they did was build two bases. I, I'm assuming the CBs went in in the lower part of Greenland in uh, 1941, I think it was. 
and they uh, open two air bases there in the mountains, and it is mountainous. Uh, there's no flat land in Greenland. Uh, and uh, the southernmost there was at uh, Nassaswak, which is Bluey West One, and uh, that's on the southern tip near Cape Fowl. Can we try an experiment here? Uh, can you show us, this is my very crude drawing of Greenland, can you hold it in front of you there? Well, Bluey West One would be down in here somewhere. And, uh, By Cape Farewell? Uh, the, the air base, yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. Okay, at, this at, is at the, the Arctic time, Circle. So yeah. you're just below it. Yeah. Blue West 8 was above the circle. Sandy Stromford, which is in Danish, I guess, for sound, it went for miles and miles and miles inland. It was the biggest uh, sound in Greenland. And uh, Blue West 8 was like up in here. Uh, so any time you left it, you were crossing the circle. Mm -hmm. uh, to go down toward the Denmark Straits or around the bottom. Well, uh, this here is the yeah. Davis Straits here. Yeah. And uh, Ellesmere Island over here, Labrador and so forth here, Newfoundland down here. And the North Pole is up yeah. here. North Pole. Uh, so, uh, Godhard, the capital, would be somewhere around in here. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they call it Nuke, N-U-U-K. I've talked with them on the phone in recent years. And uh, then there was Disco Island, which was around here somewhere. So it was on there. All, what they call towns then could be less, okay. than, fi less than 50 people. Uh, so that's that was your destination. Uh, and well, we patrolled up and down the coast all the time, uh, uh, in and out. Uh, some of the towns we had to weigh anchor and uh, uh, go in the rowboat. Why I don't know, but it, uh, the skippers would go with us, and uh, I didn't always go. They'd pick certain ones to row the boat in. We didn't have a motor, and. Uh, uh, they more or less were, I guess, questioning the people that were there as to if they'd seen anything or whatever. There were a couple of places where uh, the kids had like, uh, when we first got up there, they had like German hats on. The Germans wanted, I uh, always understood the Germans had hoped when they had defeated Denmark, that they wanted to set up some kind of a submarine base there. And it would be on the west coast because that was the protected coast. At the time I was up there, if you looked on a map, you'd see one town, a one listing of a town, what they call a town on the, on the east coast. That's uh, much more violent there, although the, although the, uh, uh, Gulf Stream somewhat goes up that way and over south of Iceland into England and uh, where it disperses. Uh, so mostly we were in and out of many, many towns all the way up as far as Etah. Uh We went up there once, that's above where the present Thule is now. Uh, the uh, base where they were watching the uh, watching the Russians, especially during the Cold War. Uh, why we went to Etah to this day, I don't know, but we were up there as about, I don't know, I always tried to estimate it about eight or 900 miles from the North Pole. And uh, the, uh, you could only get in there with a ship about three months in July with the ice. And uh, Otherwise, you'd be frozen then. So why we went there, I, I don't know. But that's the northernmost point I went to. OK, one, one of the things uh, as background for what you're telling us now, some of the reading we've done show that, uh, that as early as 1940, Germans were landing on Greenland and setting up uh, camps to broadcast weather forecasts for the German uh, Air Force. 
and that uh, through 41, 42, that there were firefights that uh, either you folks or army contingents searched for the Germans and the Germans tried to hide. One of the uh, very inter interesting things that has come out of this, I think, is that the weather forecast for D-Day that Eisenhower depended on came out of Greenland that told him he could go on D-Day. Mm -hmm. And that a lot of that maybe the things that you became involved in or why you were sailing around looking for Germans is because they were setting up these meteorological camps and you were trying to stamp them out. Can you tell us about some of those trips you took? The, uh... The air, the air base, we used to get some of our information, our skipper did, uh, from observation. I think he used to get some of his information by hand from the air base. Uh, which one I don't remember, or it might have been both. Uh, because I know some of the things we did didn't come through the radio shack. And, uh, I see uh, who I would later think perhaps was a courier or something from the air bases that perhaps transferred something to him why, why we went to Eta, for instance, where they even then thinking ahead of Thule, setting up our base up there. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that I don't know. I have no way of proving it. They don't tell you these things in there. When you got up there, did they tell you about, or did, had you heard about the sinking of the Dorchester, uh, where the four chaplains... That name was familiar, but I don't... The troop ship, 600 men were lost. I, I, uh, the name was familiar, but I, I can't uh, tell you anything beyond that in my mind. How about uh, the, the destroyer Greer, torpedoed by a German submarine? Yeah. Oh, for a period of time, they were really... Oh, recently, I, I saw a television story on the German submarines. They were raising havoc all the way up and down the coast. Uh, and uh, even... Oh, it's amazing, it's amazing we didn't lose some troop ships. It's amazing. They had so many submarines out there at times. And, uh, but we never actually... The, the only thing, time we thought we might be encountering something, it was a foggy, foggy night, and it was a little, a little apprehensive when it was going on. Uh, one of the trips back we had made briefly was to put Loran on board ship. Tell us what that does. And uh, uh, only the officers operated the Loran. And as far as, as far as I understand, it was an identification system that it would send a signal out and if you didn't respond, like supposedly you were supposed to if you were friendly, uh, there was investigation. Uh, but that was strictly opposites. We didn't have that when we first, uh, when I was first aboard ship. They put it on maybe in Kittery, Maine. We came down although we came down to Agencia Newfoundland once too and had some work done. And uh, uh, anyway, uh, we were approaching this, we, we picked it up on the radar, it was in the Davis Strait somewhere. And uh, uh, you could bring it in closer and closer. And uh, finally out of the fog, it was a, a good size fishing trawler, and I remember the skipper and them shouting back and forth to it. But they, they thought it was a submarine surface, and uh, could have been a little nasty, I suppose, when I look back in later years. But uh, uh, that's the only time I could say we thought we might have had an encounter with a submarine. Uh, maybe they were there, I don't know. Did any time your ship get involved in one of these search parties looking for one of these German um, radio stations? 
Who, who were there? They were I all think, over I Greenland. think that would have come out of the Air Force bases uh, that were there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we, didn't, we didn't have the equipment to uh, uh, explore, if you use that word. Uh, of course, there was only, only uh, a small amount of barren, barren land on the bottom, beard-like of Greenland, uh, that uh, I think it probably would come under the Air Force. I'm not sure if there are any Army men there or not, but I, I know in both bases because I, I went to their rec halls once in a while. and. Uh, in fact, I have a photograph of uh, Sergeant Neff, who was a radio operator in the air base, uh, that I came to know through the recreation hall. So I'd have to say that in the answer to that question, it was whatever, whoever was at the air base. I don't know whether there are Army men there or not. I know Air Force, both places. Okay. Those when, are the only two bases. When you pointed to the map a moment ago and, 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 and in talking with us, you went way up to the, almost to the top of Greenland. Right. Up through the Davis Straits, I guess. Yeah. Uh, what were you doing there? What, what was your mi mission? Well, this is, uh, this is what I was saying a moment ago. It was up to you, ETA. It isn't on all maps, E-T-A-H. It, it does show, I noticed on the big map they had for some project uh, at the entrance. It's an excellent map of Greenland there. I think it's some school project or something. But that map does show ETA, which is above Thule. Uh, uh, I have a, a movie on Thule uh, when they're trying to salvage the uh, B-52, I think it was there in recent years. And uh, so, uh, no, I don't, to this day, I don't know why we were up there except that when I see what happened in later years, uh, it might have had something to do with the location of the base up there, the mm -hmm. Thule. I don't know. When they started using Greenland as, as a ferrying base, the planes were coming up. A lot of B-17s and 24s went through there. Did you have anything to do with uh, search and rescue or uh, part of the passage of what was literally thousands of airplanes? Uh, no, no, we never had to get involved. There were times when it could be two weeks, more than two weeks, when there were no planes flying because of the overcast that hung. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there just wouldn't be anything in or out. Now, whether they were, air, whether they were going via Gander in Newfoundland at that time, I don't know. Uh, uh, I think some of them might have been using Reykjavik in Iceland. Uh, but I know Gander, and uh, there would be times, yes, two, two or three weeks when you never saw the sun. Never saw the sun. And uh, there would be no planes, there would be no mail, no supplies. Uh, Although, rather times to be beautiful, sunshiny day like today, and uh, uh, the the planes would uh, would come in below and leave from south of where I was most of the time, and uh, so they could come from the U.S. and land there and leave for Europe, and I would never see them, know that they had come or gone because. Yeah. We were basically north, <clears throat> north of there, and uh, they sure had a lot of supplies up there in the mountains. Huh. I don't know what they were going to do with all the crated refrigerators and washing machines and 55-gallon drums of oil. <laughs> yeah, they're still up there. <laughs> they're probably still up there. Yeah. From the very first that you were in the Coast Guard. Uh, walking beaches on Long Island um, and your early patrols, the Germans were your enemy and they had some pretty big ships that 
used to take off through the Denmark Straits, breaking out into the Atlantic, North Atlantic. Did you ever once encounter a hostility from a German ship or aircraft or any kind of combat? No, no, no fortunately no. Uh, the, uh, Well, it was no. It wasn't. It wasn't slowing down. The German, Germans weren't that slowed down at that time. Uh, they were still quite active. Uh, the only way uh, I used to make up a little newspaper daily and listen to the, the units I'm supposed to listen to, if anything happened. But I could also listen to Reuters out of. England and uh, Europe, rather, and uh, another station out of the United States. And I used to make up a little newspaper, so we knew where the war was going and at what point over in Europe and Japan. And then I would staple the pages together and put the, put it in the, the mess hall, being a small group. And the guys could read it. I used to keep the ball scores like that, let them know what was going on in the major leagues. And uh, uh, so that at least they had some news, you know. And uh, other than that, they had a miniaturized Time Mag, I think it was Time. They used to have, like the Reader's Digest, but it was much smaller, and it was smaller print condensed form that they would issue and eventually some of that would get aboard ship. Uh, how, I don't know. So uh, uh, we're aware of what was going on uh, around the world. Uh, and uh, I think I, I showed you earlier, I happened to be on duty when, uh, uh, when the Japanese surrendered, for instance, and I, I typed that. I still have a copy of it. And when uh, FDR died, I happened to be on duty then, went out to all nav, in other words, all ships. They had a certain code for that. And uh, so I've kept those as my man, was copies of them. I didn't have anything on Europe. I couldn't have been on duty. But uh, first thing you did, with something like that is make sure that the executive officers had a copy and that uh, it, depending on what it was, it's okay to give the crew a copy, which in those cases it was, so that they could see, uh, read and see what was going on. On a typical run for you, you'd leave port, take off. How long might you be at sea? At sea? Yeah. Uh, we only did it would depend on the ice conditions. We had reinforced bow. Uh, it was added because the ship was up there. You break an ice at times. And uh, the, uh, I think top speed on that was probably around 11 or 12 knots. But we very seldom were doing that. So if we went up to, say in the case, Ita, which might have been a thousand miles, close to a thousand miles, from Bluey West Eight, which is the Arctic Circle. Uh, a couple of days or so, I guess it'd come out to. And uh, uh, I think it took a couple of days to come down to Newfoundland. Of course, in the rough sea, you're losing almost as much ground as you're gaining. <laughs> it seems though you're not making any headway. <laughs> and at times the screw propeller might come out of the water, you know. <laughs> That's what you're worried about when it shook the ship. And uh, so uh, I would say a couple of to three days at the most. Some, some places we would anchor and we'd go ashore. Uh, once in a while we'd go in because of certain nice conditions, we'd go into a small harbor. Uh, Skip ahead to have had uh, 
the uh, oceanographic maps of the whole area to go to places we went to anchor out of a storm or something. I remember one we went into was quite violent, and uh, we saw uh, an Eskimo waving to us. So uh, we lowered the the uh, lifeboat and. Skip and I, I was uh, one of the ones selected to row. We went ashore, and he had uh, a child with him. They lived in a sod and stone igloo-type building, all by themselves, cold, windy. And his wife, all she had was brown roots for teeth, and that was why he was signaling, wondering if we could do anything for his wife, and we couldn't. We had nothing to take care of it. What was uh, wrong, wrong with the woman? The what? What was wrong with the woman? Her teeth were all gone. Oh. And he was wondering if we could do something for her, but we couldn't. I don't know whether they gave us some cigarettes to pack the tobacco old style and they were aching teeth or what. But. Uh, Terrible life they led. Yeah, pretty pretty remote yeah. place. Yeah. You've spoken of going back um, toward Newfoundland and uh, Labrador. Did you get up in that area? Did you ever go the other way? Did you get to Europe at any time? No, we didn't. Uh, there was only the one town on the east coast, and that was. There wasn't anything active there to speak of, but we had, we had uh, perhaps the Spencer, which was like a cruiser. I would hear of the Spencer, the Escanaba. I would say that they were out on that coast, that area. Uh, the Spencer was involved in some stuff that we had scuttlebutt about, and uh, then they had. Uh, Iceberg lookout, watching you know for the ships, uh, either airplanes or. Uh, I was glad I never got that duty. They just follow. Just follow the icebergs day after day after day, charting them and sending in signal where they were, all the way down off the coast of Virginia. They said some of them. So some of these big convoys that had to go northern if they were headed up to Vladivostok or something. Uh, they depended on you guys to give them weather, right? But also to track some of the the ice flow, yeah, right? And uh, uh, I have to think that the Escanaba and the uh, and the uh, and the Spencer uh, were very active out there. Uh, the east wind, I never I never uh, got to see it, but it was around. That was about a four hundred foot icebreaker. It had screw propellers on the front also that sucked the water off from under the ice and they could pile up onto eight feet of ice and break it. And uh, I have a note here that the Escanaba was torpedoed by a U-boat while escorting a convoy from Argenta and lost 101 out of 103. Yeah, probably. Is that yeah. correct? Could be, yeah. Was, yeah. Is that before you got up there? I think so, yeah. Yeah, it, uh, Agencia uh, was, uh, we didn't stop in Halifax. Uh, I stopped in Agencia once on the way down, and I don't know, as I said previously, if that's where we had the Loran put on. Uh, but we did stop in there, and one interesting thing was that as we were pulling into the dock, Somebody on the Navy ship about the size of ours is waving to me. Who the heck was it? But any, any gay from Natick that I really? that I went to school with. He was on a Navy ship there, and he noticed, recognized me as we were pulling in the dock in Agencia. And uh, we were there long enough. I lost track of him. Uh, we were there long enough so that he took me. Up to his, he had married a girl there, 
uh, he took me uh, up to her house up in the hills someplace in Argentia. She was a school, a school teacher. And uh, I remember being in the house, it was very camp-like. The animals underneath where it was built into the hillside. Uh, yeah, then he gay, and I could never, never locate him after the war. I don't know what happened to him. He's on the board downstairs. There is another Ernest Gay, but it's not the same one. Uh, so that was surprising. It, it must <laughs> have been. There and have yeah, somebody give you a feeling from, again how small a world is. From school, yeah, yeah. You talked a moment ago about uh, when the war ended in Japan. Uh, where were you when the war ended in Europe? In Greenland. In Greenland. And you got the word that uh, in May of uh, 45 that it's all over in Europe? Uh, as I say, I, I wasn't on duty then to have heard this aboard our ships. It would have come through us. Yeah. Uh, I did get, I was on my eight hour ship in Japan. So uh, it was a, the type of message that from uh, the secretary, of, in our case, uh, Forrestal was the secretary of the Navy. Uh, it was his duty out of Washington to alert the Navy, Coast Guard, Marines. All NAV is the code they use for it, ALNAV. And so this would alert me that it's something for me to copy down because it included us. And that's, uh, that's why I knew when Japan had surrendered and also when President Roosevelt now maybe one of the other men was aboard, uh, was on duty. Uh, only one of us was on duty at a time. We had three men, and uh, so on the European one, uh, it must have been one of the other two radio men that was on duty when it came through. Say. Did you think then that you might be sent out to the Pacific, or what? What? What was no, your feeling no, about that? I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I had no. I don't remember that I had any thoughts at all about that. Uh, of course, it was only about what three months, at the most, and Japan surrendered after Europe anyway. May to August, yeah. Yeah, about 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 three months, and uh, the. Uh, I don't know whether we, you know, would even become organized up there. Uh, I think they, I think they were starting, they were starting to take some of the surplus supplies out of the bases. Uh, maybe they didn't know Japan was going to be so quick, so they were going to transfer supplies. Unbelievable, uh, the Quonset Hudson. You could fill this room with wooden pencils, boxes of wooden pencils, tools. Radios, you know, military radios, tools packed in grease. There were warehouses full of them. And uh, on the way up to the rec hall, as they said, in the in the valleys, in the mountains, you'd see from the we'd go in an army truck uh, with the canvas top. You'd see uh, uh, thousands and thousands of fifty-five gallon drums stacked up on their sides, and uh, what they would tell us were washing machines and dryers for them. What the military was going to do with all of them, I don't know. And uh, uh, like Quonset had full of candy. Who was going to eat it all? Yeah, that makes sense, yeah. We did have one amusing thing. I have a photograph of it. Somehow, a delicacy, we, we got a, a case of frozen strawberries aboard ship. And uh, the skippers found out about it, and we got reprimanded as to how the strawberries got aboard ship thing. Sounds like Captain Quig. But, but I know the cook brought some of it down to the wardrobe for the officers. <laughs> so they, they enjoyed the strawberries, but they had to reprimand us. <laughs> Herman Woke made a, made a lot out of that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. How did you get home finally after you? Uh, I came, home. I came home on the uh, Mojave, a large ship, 
uh, Coast Guard Cutter Mojave in, uh, to Boston uh, in the wintertime. Uh, I had one of the machinist mates with me, Steve, and uh, was kind of a friend of mine, but we, the points had gotten to the point where I could come home. Well, I didn't quite have enough to leave, uh, but Bill McDonald, one, one, of the, one of the radio men had already gone home on points, so now we're down to two. So it didn't matter when we were at dock, but when we were out patrolling, it was four on and four off for two to three months, the two of us. And uh, so Bill McDonald, who lived in Somerville, was the first class, I was second class, was kind enough to say, uh, to uh, talk the skipper and allow me to go home ahead of him because he was trying to make up his mind whether he was going to make a further career out of oh, yeah. the service. He, yeah. he was in several years. Because there was talk amongst different ones, even the machinists, chief, chief machinists, whether they would re-up. Uh, one of them had 13 years in. He said, gee, what, what do I know to do in civilian life? I'll probably end up signing up again. So it was, this had to be after, I think, after Germany had surrendered, that this conversation was going on. Would you or wouldn't you, you know, rejoin? So anyway, that's how I got home on the... Uh, uh, Mojave. Mojave. I have, I have a, a picture. Okay. Of, uh, you had a... You know, it went to a lot of places, saw a lot of people, saw a lot of things. And can you tell us if there's a most memorable experience in your whole career in the Coast Guard? One thing that stands out above others? Uh, one thing that... It doesn't really surprise me. I, I, never, I never was bitter. Uh, I didn't ever have an officer or a superior boot camp or otherwise that I disliked. Uh, sometimes it's a little surprising that uh, in our forecastle was small where we slept three high on either side. I was in the middle one most of the time. So when the guy in the top one was had a step on the rail out of my bunk to get up in his. And uh, the side rail was three quarter inch galvanized water pipe to keep it from falling out because you only had two inch mattress on canvas. That in such close quarters, not much bigger than this room, that uh, say 15, 18 guys could get along so well for so long. They, uh, I guess they were like me that they figured, well, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah. And uh, never, I can't remember one dispute, one argument amongst the men. It's amazing to be in such close confines, away from home for so long. I had one man, I just mentioned with my wife this morning. Uh, I was single, I'm a young guy. He had four kids and a wife home. Tougher for him, right? I should think so, yeah. He wasn't so. even yeah. to grow up. Yeah. Uh, I have uh, a photo there of one of my skippers, Will Lowe, in his, ward in his wardrobe, what they call the wardrobe where they lived, very confined. In the background I see photos of his two children, and I assume of the children, and his wife in the background. And uh, so my feelings walked to him too. He had a wife and two kids home. Waiting for the war to be over. Yeah. And you're yeah. close up to, I, I was going to ask you, uh, when and where were you discharged? 
when they, oh when in, and uh, where? in Boston. Boston. Uh, yeah. Uh, and the dates in '46. Yeah, uh, May I think it was. Uh, I went briefly. I don't. I don't know why, but they, uh, as they said, the McDonald put me ahead of him coming down from Greenland. So I had some brief time in at the base in Boston uh, because I could type. They they had me in the uh, payroll office for a few weeks. Uh, I had a civilian lady boss, very nice lady. Uh, but uh, we were working with like index cards, but there were payroll and payroll deductions. And uh, that's what I did all day. Uh, because it wasn't quite my time point wise to get out. So then all of a sudden, for some reason, they put me on the Raritan, another one about maybe a little bigger than the one I'd been on. And we went down at night uh, through the Suez Canal, uh, through the uh, Cape Cod Canal to Woods Hole. This had to be early spring of 46, I'd say. Uh, all the nice homes down there, I'm assuming they were the wealthier people. We were all plywooded up the windows and everything. We could see the next day uh, for the war time. Apparently nobody was living there during the war. And uh, so uh, in going there, we hit some, it was at night, we hit some submerged ledge put a pretty good dent in the hole and uh, damaged the screw propeller. Uh, but it didn't, uh, it didn't uh, hamper our operation. To, they slowed down, run the ship slow because of the screw propeller damage, but you could still operate. But they wouldn't run it, I guess, top speed because it would cause vibration. When I think of it, something that happened not too long ago, was it the Queen Mary? Hit bottom. Did hit? It's unbelievable that some of that ledge is still uncharted. And that was only recent years, right? The QE2, I think, that uh, hit that. Did it hit? Yeah, it sure did. Well, that's what happened to us. Yeah. And uh, so uh, it was only a matter of days that I was on there. Apparently they needed a radio operator, so they took me out of the payroll up. Anyway, that's that's where I got discharged from. My brother, my older brother, who was, uh, had already been discharged from the Army, uh, and somehow he had an old car, he picked me up at the base. And you were out. <laughs> and they gave me three or four dollars to get home on the train or something, or whatever they gave me. Oh, you. sure, very generous. And, uh, I seem to remember something about $9, or why $9, I don't know. But we didn't come right home. We headed down. It had to be the old roots because I didn't know anything much about Massachusetts. Then. Let me ask you what rank you uh, were discharged with. Uh, Radio Man Second Class. And what decorations did you have? What ribbons uh, did was, you come uh, home with? Uh, there were about four. One of them, I don't know why, it said something about Africa, Europe. I don't have them. I don't know what happened. Uh, but uh, uh, did you join that's any? I remember. Did you join any reserve unit after you came home? Uh, no, I, I kind of had, re you know, you're anxious to get out and go on with life. And I'd already, in spring of '46. I had met my present wife, <laughs> so uh, that meant a lot too, getting out, you know. Oh, sure. I didn't know at the time I was going to marry her, but <laughs> I did. was still in uniform. Did you join any veterans organizations? Uh, I was in the VFW for a few years. Yeah, now. okay. Yeah. Are you currently any member no, of, no. of any organization? No. The, uh, what kind of reception did you get from your family? Did uh, 
Did you sit down and talk with them about what you'd done and what you'd seen? Or were you too busy uh, getting ready for I your marriage? I don't, I don't really remember. Uh, I don't think it would have been on discharge because while I was uh, the weeks at the base there awaiting discharge, I was able to go to Park Square and get the bus home. I had like a 40 hour week at the payroll office for a few weeks just prior to discharge. Yeah. Because I had the lady civilian boss, uh, although everyone that she had uh, control of was in uniform in that office and at the headquarters. So uh, my brother picked me up there and we went right down to the old warehouses in Fall River and bought our first civilian clothes before we got home. I don't know where we got the old car, but he had a car. And, and gas, too. Up, he picked me up in Boston, and that's where we went and got our civilians. Buddy, how, um, how important to you was serving in the military during, oh, very, during time very, of war? Very, I, uh, hindsight, uh, I think I would have enjoyed a career in the Coast Guard. I think so. Uh, of course, at that time, uh, hey, I want to get out and get my silly clothes on, right? Uh, and go on with life. I, uh, but that's hindsight. Uh, good branch of the service. The reason, one reason I'm still quite aware of where I was and so forth. I took a great interest in it. Uh, I have uh, videos from Grandman. I've done research throughout the years. Any book I could read, I just got through reading another one, uh, Land of Ice, uh, Dupre, I think it was, they got it for me out of the Belmont Library. Uh, so I know my locales and so forth. and. Uh, uh, I've talked with them up there on the phone, not in the last year or so. It gets to be expensive in the airways. <laughs> but uh, uh, I even thought I might like to go up there on a vacation sometime, but it's very costly. I suppose it is. Not yeah, many ships I go up there, Go to there, Ottawa, actually. Uh, and uh, there's no roads. Even today, there's no roads, uh, even though they're trying to build up uh, some tourism with skiing and so forth and so on. But uh, uh, I've learned quite a bit about the, about the country up there and uh, I'm still, still learning about it. Well, it's it's, a, pretty, it's a pretty big one, uh, yeah, 800,000 yeah. miles, uh, square miles. Oh yeah. Uh, you, you had quite a time in, in the service since uh, your discharge, have you received any veterans' benefits, such as hospitalization, the GI Bill, or insurance, anything like that? Uh, no. No. Is there one thing that uh, I haven't asked you today, any one thought or incident about your uh, career in, in the Coast Guard that you'd like to tell us about this morning? Uh, I think they perform a great service. I see that more and more. A good many people didn't realize it. Uh, at the time I went in, it was under the Treasury Department. But we also were somewhat under Navy. Uh, during the war. And uh, so uh, a good many people think that it's, they're just up and down the coastline here uh, uh, watching the sailboats or something, but it isn't that. Rescue, search and rescue. Well, you've seen it, the uh, catastrophes. Uh, we lost, we lost some of our men over in the Pacific landing crafts and so forth. Uh, they were everywhere. 
uh, perform in their duty as all others were. My heart goes out to them all. Uh, and yet, I didn't see anything like some of those poor guys. When I, I almost don't want to watch Normandy, Pacific. I had an uncle who went from island to island to island. A good many people don't realize that the CBs were right in the middle of it. Everywhere, a good many places, they were the first ones. My uncle was a CB. I knew somebody else was a CB. Uh, good many places, they were the first ones in. And, uh, but for a long time, they were kind of unheralded. They must have been the ones that went in the ground and put the bases in, dropped the bulldozers and all this and that, everywhere as they went. And uh, so every, everybody, yeah, my heart goes out to them. And uh, sometimes it bothers me. I've been in town government for quite a few years, town meeting. I think it was about 15 years ago when some, we, would make an appropriation of about $300 to each of the veterans groups in Natick to help them defray some kind of cost, I don't remember what. So say about 15 years ago, there were some people actually in town meeting getting up and speaking against the $300. Unbelievable. Uh, Bitter about it? No, but I can't get myself to believe it. Uh, every day, even over in Iraq, people are too busy to know what the guys are going through over there, right? Uh, they're off to the train, they're off to the com commute to work and home and the exercise club. I've got a neighbor, he's been through all in Iraq, he's over in Korea now, in the, uh, in the Marines, they're everywhere. We have people, I think, in 130 some odd countries right now. Why they're there, I don't know. We still have people in Scotland, where the planes went down. So you wonder, uh, yeah, I, uh, quite an experience, yes. Thankfully, unlike so many, I didn't get shot at. I'm glad. Thanks for coming in Thank today. You. Really much appreciated. Thank you very much. Hang on a second. <laughs>